You guys are sick. This is our third stream of the week, and you're mad at us because we're one minute late, Henry Mudo? I mean, Pat, what are these guys turning into entitled individuals? Hey man, we don't we don't just live to serve. I don't know. <laughs> you're right. We live to serve our own egos by streaming nonstop. That's right. Um we this both, I've a, been having like a Peter Overzet level of streams since over the last couple weeks. Not quite, obviously, but uh, I don't know how you do it. It's pretty intense to be streaming like every almost every day. Yeah, um, this week is is nuts because what I realized is I had like my usual batch of shows and then people who had asked me to be guests on shows. I was like, oh, I'm gone this week. Let's do it the next week. And that every additional guest spot uh, got pushed uh, to this week. So I, I added it up earlier and I'm pacing for 16 shows this week. So I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to need to relax come Saturday. Yeah, man. <laughs> yeah. It, like, pretty intense. I, and it was just, you know, I think normally I would be like, man, I don't know if we should stream both of our pros versus Joe's drafts. But I had just got a week without... Uh, like and I still did a few shows from vacation, but it felt like I was going through withdrawals. Yeah, dude, I felt the same way. And I did we did like a long stream. We did multiple minis while I was on vacation. So I actually streamed quite a bit, but there's something about I don't know if I just like really like being in front of these monitors that I got here or what, but I, I know the feeling. Yeah, I can't like even just working and getting regular stuff done, like I'll get stuff done that I absolutely have to. But it's like I, I need my monitors. I need my station mm -hmm, to mm -hmm. actually get shit done. Otherwise, I just punt it all. I'm like, I'll, I'll do that when I'm back at my desk. Exactly. Um, yes, everyone is uh, talking. First of all, Sam, my name is not Pete. Um, actually, my name is Pete. Pat's name is not Pete. <laughs> okay. Pat's name is now the NBC Sports Edge background here. That's right. Well, you know, I felt like I got the ship chasing background here. Give a little love to NBC. Don't need to double up on ship chasing background. So I there thought about getting a background, but I Plus, thought now I can get the I can literally put my head in the peacock. <laughs> you are officially that. peacock Pat. That's peacock Pat for you. <laughs> this is actually a good idea. We could start selling ad space on your green screen. <laughs> I'll have to look into that. Gee, guys, let us let us ease into the show here. You guys are just coming hard. You're late. Give us the Rojo takes. Play the LaVisca highlight reel. Uh, what 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 is he referring to? There was the blurb about is Rojo in the best shape of his life or something. Uh, I had dinner and I didn't catch the Ronald Jones best shape of his life blurb. What? Uh, what no, no, missed? there was something you you even quote retweeted the other day. It was something like he's looking good in camp. You tell me. Oh, yeah, they were talking about how he's looking good, you know, which we know. We know he's a good rusher. Uh, all the numbers back that up. Um, I'm looking to see if I missed a blurb. You didn't miss a blurb. I was literally referring to a tweet I saw you post. Yeah. Yeah, Pewter Report. report. The, the context that I'll add is that back when I was digging through the reports two years ago to see if anyone believed in Rojo in, in the Tampa Bay area, Pewter Report did not. They were very anti Rojo. They were very pro Dare Gumbawale, um, a take that is not not aged all that well. And um, to see them now in on Rojo is actually kind of nice. I'm glad they I'm glad they came around. They came around. Uh, I mean, Gio Bernard is going to be a, a souped up Dare, right? Yeah, yeah. He calls it the Nickelback. Bruce Arians is very into Nickelback. He loves Nickelback, so he's going to be playing that. Uh, that role pretty heavily. And that's, we saw Dari in that role. We saw Leonard Fournette in that role um, kind of down the stretch. It's a valuable role. You get all the two minute drill stuff and you get all the kind of obvious passing down third down stuff. So I think Gio will, I've been taking a lot of Gio. I think he's in a, in a pretty valuable role. Um, there's another thing, Pat, you have all these brand guys uh, this year. Here's another one I'm going to pull up that we need to discuss uh, your boy, Zach Ertz. Showing up to camp, he's someone pissed yellow on Zach Ertz's head. Yeah, yeah, I am uh, rescinding my brand on Zach Ertz after this this uh, this new look. I can't be. I think my whatever my exposure to Zach Ertz is is uh, frozen as of today. For yeah, Alex, 
This is like a massive cell phone. I was in on Rojo before Pat Bags. <laughs> that, that's just that's just how you own yourself. I mean, I didn't. I don't watch a lot. Of, that could be true. I don't watch a lot of college football. I was only heavily invested in him <laughs> once he entered the league. So, um, yeah. I mean, Zach, are you are you done with this Zach Ertz thing, Pat, or what? No, I'm not. I'll still draft him. <laughs> I mean, he's he's so cheap. Like. I mean, he he goes he goes around Mo Ali Cox like I, I like Mo Ali Cox, but like if if he's gone, I'll take Ertz. Like, I, and I don't feel that the, there's that much difference between. Do you know them. who else is cheap? Calvin Johnson, and he's not even playing anymore. I, I mean, like, yeah, what, of course he's cheap because he's he's done. My general theory on tight ends is that like there's like probably like there's like three guys who are definitely playing a different position than everyone else, and then there's like basically everybody else and you're kind of hoping that tj hawkinson and mark andrews and noah fant will like turn into the guys who are playing a different position than everyone else but zach Ertz is a bad version of a guy who plays a different position than everyone else he is a bad wide receiver with tight end eligibility and i still think a bad tight end a bad wide receiver with tight end eligibility is still better than like half the tight ends in the league for fantasy because they just don't do anything they're just useless yeah yeah. Um, I don't know. Yeah. I've just, I don't, I guess I don't get that. I haven't been getting that gross in my tight ends. I don't, I guess. Like imagine on, if Larry Fitzgerald had tight end eligibility for the last like five he years. Should. He should. He should have, but like we would have been drafting him in like the fifth round. Larry Fitzgerald <laughs> should have canceled his wide receiver camp and gone to tight end you with Jordan have. Matthews to convert to tight end. Um, yeah. We, we are also at the point of the season where I'm now realizing like we're now getting the overreactions to camp reports to the point we were in our chat with Davis earlier. Davis at 1028 a.m. shares a tweet from Jeff McClain. Jalen Rager in just sneaks. Looks like the Eagles second year wide receiver will start camp on the sidelines. Pat goes, ugh. And then literally like two minutes later, check that Rager after going through warmups and sneaks is in cleats and helmet. Never saw that before. Carry on. Davis well, blessed. The second one came from me. Cause you know, I went and was like, Oh God, what's happening. And I saw all these people taking victory laps. Like, Oh, he's on the bench. Guess he's going to be there. Like, guess he's getting used to where he's going to be all season. And then I'm like, guys, he's, he's changing into his cleats. Like give him a second. You know how like uh, when someone gets hurt, you know, in the first quarter of a game and everyone's like, well, there goes my lineups. And it's like, and then they kind of end up coming back like next quarter or yeah. whatever. Yeah. I yeah. feel like with these off season blurbs, there should be a function where you can't share or comment on them until like after 10 minutes. I mean, I, I can't be getting tweets about Jalen Raker being in sneakers at the start of camp and then start panicking. I, know, I, I can't man. do this. I agree. And like, I have been doing like the the new shifts now and I see stuff and I'm like I I feel like I need to control myself. I have been controlling myself, but there was one this morning that was like Aaron Rodgers like to talk to reporters after practice and I was like should I be like covering this? Like is this news? And of course it's not news. We wait until the press conference and then that's the news. But like the thought crossed my mind that like the people need to know that Aaron yeah. Rodgers is going to talk to them later. Yeah. It's crazy. I, yeah. We're we're all insane right now. And also the other funny thing is I, I think the Cowboys uh, were one of a couple teams that started camp a little earlier. So all of the footage from camps like for a few days was just Cowboys. And, you know, once camps get going, at least the videos that get shown are generally somewhat interesting, like a deep ball or a nice move. But right now it's just like literally every play from Cowboys camp is getting shown. It's like, here are these guys jogging wind sprints before practice. Well, are you seeing the CD ones? Oh God, here we the go. The CD ones are pretty good, Pete. This the ADP the, on him is he's going to be going next to Calvin Ridley in a in another couple. It's uh, also stupid. I saw I saw one of George Kittle making a sick catch from literally about an hour ago. It's like no fucking shit. He's George Kittle. That's what he's supposed to do. You you can't adjust the ranks. Guy does thing he is known to do. I, I agree. Could you send me the link to that though? <laughs> Oh my God. Are you guys going to make us talk about Deshaun Watson again tonight? The entire pros versus Joe stream was you guys just imagining teams he could be on and what, you know, imaginary stacks I could do in the 18th round. <laughs> they love him. They love drafting Watson. 
Uh, so tonight we wanted to take uh, this opportunity to thank the community. No, um, to <laughs> yeah, what did we get? Did we get an award? <laughs> like what's happening? <laughs> Um, we were rewarded as uh, the best piss boys of the summer <laughs> of 2021. Hot piss boy summer. <laughs> um, to talk through some of our early main event drafts, because we do now have two in the books. Pat and I wrapped up our slow draft uh, a few days ago. Uh, hopefully you guys have checked out the mini episodes. Pat, I think you're slacking on the audio. Did those end up getting up? They're up. They're all up. Okay. He's not slacking. So... All of the mini sode audio is up. The videos are for members on the channel. And then we also wrapped up our slow draft with our friends from the Discord, uh, Ralph Worm and Tyler. So I wanted to do kind of uh, a little retrospective, some stuff we learned, kind of what we think um, early, you know, optimal main event strategy is and, and how we might approach the rest of our drafts going forward. Yeah, I love it. Um, receive here has the the true early lesson, which was to take Daryl Henderson. Yes. Yeah, so, Pat, we uh, we do have Daryl Henderson on both of our main event teams. Is that are we geniuses or are we lucky? Lucky, man. We're lucky, but that's you know you structure yourself to benefit from the chaos, right? So, it's a little luck that Daryl Henderson is going to be an easy starter for us. And uh, obviously terrible what happened to Cam Akers, but those teams are now in much better shape with Joe Henderson on them. Yes. Oh, that's the wrong one here. I was going to pull up our first main event draft where we got, let's see. Nope, that's still the wrong one. I need a tutorial. I'm just going to close that out. Too many Chrome tabs name the same thing. Draft board. Here we go. So this was our first team we did from the 11 hole. Uh, many of you guys have listened to us talk about some of these, but I think, um, also I should plug, we're going to be going yeah. on the, what's the, what's the name of the show? Uh, what's Shelly's it's show? Shelly's show. Yeah. Yeah. The half Millie Billies, I think that's the right. goat district pod. Yeah. Yeah. Goat district. Yeah. So we're going to go on there. They're the team that drafted from the 12 hole. So we're going to talk through, uh, some of the dynamics of this draft. Uh, but yeah, I think. One of the things that's been crystallizing for me in these drafts is how, and we talked about it a little bit on the pros versus Joes, where the FFPC drafters let you off the hook going with a running back and tight end early because they are going to continue to pound receivers and reach for the second tier of tight ends in the middle rounds and allow you to get really nice wide receivers. And I'm, I'm still trying to think of scenarios where I don't necessarily think running back tight end is the dominant start, but right now I still very much feel that way. I think the scenarios would be if you had a Javante Williams or Travis Etienne realistically coming back to this spot at the 5'11", or if you were set up differently, like if you were in the mid, um, if you were in the mid first and wanted to go Waller. And felt like you could get ETN or, or Williams there. Because I think those guys allow you to do things a little bit differently. Um, and certainly, like, you do one exposure, I think, to Diggs and Hill. Yeah. So, but the, the early tight end this year especially feels, feels really strong. Um, I don't think I'll be arguing for pits in any of these drafts. Uh, I do have best ball exposure, but he feels very pricey to me here. Uh, I was just looking at Calvin Ridley's numbers um, when he was a rookie. And if you just convert Calvin Ridley's rookie season to a tight end, like he's not, he's getting like, I think it was like 15 points per game in tight end premium. That's not, you, you need more out of that spot. Um, like I think even the positional advantage, like that's not going to, like Hawkinson and Andrews are going to, are going to match. So anyway, um, I think the, the early tight end is probably the more important part than the early running back. Cause I, think there are spots where you can get away with taking a, a running back at like the fifth or the sixth or going true zero running back this time here I think is is still quite doable it's once you get into like September that Alexander Madison is going to be like too expensive 
you know, and Jamal Williams is going to go in like the eighth round. Like there's all this stuff. Remember Darwin Thompson when we were drafting a couple years ago is going in like the eighth round and Justice Hill like going yeah. in the eighth round. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. So we're not going to be able to sit back. This little pocket you see here, 8, 9, 10, 11, I think is like a July to maybe early to mid-August pocket. Once that pocket goes away, it starts to be more uncomfortable to go true zero running back. Yeah, I mean, not to mention, I I feel like, I don't know, but guys like Darrington Evans going in the 12th, even Geo in the 13th, Penny, I don't, maybe I just still have kind of underdog ADP brain, but this seems like really, really early for some some true flyers. I mean, they're flyers we like, but I mean, the opportunity cost of those picks uh, in that round are, I mean, like, what are the chance? I mean, Paris Campbell's role like this year versus a guy like Rashad Penny. I just feel like, I don't know. I, I think the running backs are just getting pushed up so much that I'm almost feeling like this looks like uh, a later August kind of board to me. I think the difference is that you'll see some of these scratch offs fall down because we'll know more. Like there'll be there'll be less guys that we're interested in, and so you'll see some of them get pushed up even higher and then some of them fall down and then you'll see the guys that are going in that pocket i think get pushed up too so yeah. there's my my guess is that you know like jared dokes and stuff like that or um we'll probably have more clarity on malcolm brown and salvin Ahmed, or you know stuff yeah. like that to where one won't they won't go in the, the 16th one will go in like the 13th and one will go in like the 19th yeah which is a good point because it's basically our certainty uh on these guys changes because of news reports or you know preseason play but the actual probability of you know doesn't actually change it's just the market's opinion on them changes right right um yeah and i think so my thing with the zero rb and i and i get trust me like that their hill dig start is awesome now obviously Devonte adams is going to be in play at that turn pick in a, in a running back heavy room. I just think you need to have a very thought out reverse engineered plan for your draft of, like you said, I'm going to either be making these detours for one of the rookie running backs, or I know I like grabbing Noah Fant like I did in pros versus Joe's, or you need to have the stomach for the Blair and Sean where you are. There's a, there's scenarios where you could take a wide receiver's, in a tight end for the first 10 rounds. Like that's, and a quarterback. that's a possibility or in a quarterback. Yeah. 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 And I, I mean, we're, we're currently in a draft now in another main event now, and I, I don't know if we'll end up in that position or not, but I would certainly be comfortable doing that. We don't yet have a running back through five. So I think you do have to be comfortable doing that. Um, and again, remains to be seen how the board falls, but I think that that still works quite well. And in and, and this board, A.J. Dillon in the ninth, you know, Tony Pollard in the ninth, Zach Moss in the ninth. Like, those are pretty awesome ninth-round picks, actually. Yeah. Yeah, and that and that's the thing for me, too. And I, I get people are talking about kind of flipping it, um, you know, going wide receivers early, grabbing Will, Williams, ETN, Sam saying grabbing Swift at 3-8. I actually think those are interesting – kind of two v2s right if you're looking at you know i guess what i don't know if you're getting swift in the late i guess you're you're grabbing so if you're grabbing a swift or miles sanders let's say here in the middle of the third round and you're kind of debating an alvin kamara aj brown versus let's say a Devonte adams deandre swift what side of that do you want alvin kamara aj brown yeah so that that's my thing about this idea of, you know, grabbing those wide receivers there. Those two v twos are tough in the third round. I think it gets more palatable in the fifth, for sure, when you're subbing in Javante yeah. Williams instead of Brandon Ayuk. But man, I, I to me the opportunity cost of passing on an AJ Brown or CD Lamb is much higher than passing on the Devonte Adams there. Yeah, and that's why it does get tough. Because like the two v twos, I think for a long time favor the early running back, and that's we do a lot of early running back here, and that's why. Because like, you're, you know, if Swift was in the fourth, 
then it would be different. You know, then it'd be like there's kind of a tear break. DJ Moore goes Swift at 402 there, which obviously he was not there. But like if we could have gone Diggs Swift versus Gibson Evans, I think that's Diggs Swift. Mm-hmm. Right. But Swift's not an option. He's just too expensive. You know, or you could go, you could say like, well, we could have done, you know, uh, Javante and Diggs versus Gibson and Claypool. If Javante actually fell to the early sixth, which he doesn't. So it's just like the 2v2s where you'd actually take the later running back don't work because the running back's not actually there. But it's just, it's a, it's about a half round difference, I think, until, um, until you would actually want to take the, the the later running back 2v2. And that's that's another really good point about it is it's it's not uh god I I say in a vacuum way too much. I need to start like uh giving something away when I say in a vacuum. Uh but You should sell right. vacuums, dude. You should give away <laughs> I I will give away a a, a Hoover. Um <laughs> you you're paying for the information like when you start running back wide receiver you are giving yourself the or running back tight end here you're allowing yourself to if if you we saw a crazy fall on miles sanders or deandre swift say those guys fall to the fifth like late five or whatever we're gonna we're gonna gobble that up and you can do that but there are scenarios where you start in the best possible player is going to be wide receiver round after round after round after round. And that's why you have to be willing to commit to start right. with eight wide receivers, a QB and a tight end. Yeah. And that's in some ways, like if you do the running, if you do the wide receivers right out of the gate, like you're saying, you have the most flexibility. Like, I actually think you have the most flexibility, like the more wide receivers that you've taken because you can continue hammering wide receiver. Uh, Cause that's the position you want. You want to be absolutely crushing people in the flex with, with really, really strong wide receivers and then kind of figuring the running back positions out. Um, and especially if you have the elite tight end, if we had not taken Gibson, if we had taken Diggs, let's say, then I think it's much easier for us to go Lamar Jackson instead of Chase Claypool. In fact, and I think we'd probably go ahead and make that. Um, and so then at that point, it's just like, if a running back happens to fall to you, you can scoop him up. If it if he doesn't, you know you don't have to. But but similarly, like the elite uh, quarterback, the last guy in that tier was was there for us in the sixth. And because we had taken Gibson, and because we had taken Kittle already, we took the wide receiver. But I think like the that's kind of what I mean. When I say the wide receiver heavier you are, the the more flexibility like I feel like I have. Yeah, and the other thing too, and in, and in Gretch and Sean have talked about this too is. And I think it's close, but when you look at Team 11 and 12, and I'm sure we'll talk about this with them tomorrow, I think you could make an argument that our team has more of a zero RB ethos than them because you're really starting to say what's more fragile, Gibson over Tyreek and, say, Kittle over Ridley, or Kareem Hunt over Brandon Ayuk, you know, Damian Harris over Will Fuller, you know, taking Tyler Higbee over Chenault. Like when you continue to stack those, I think in the aggregate, that ends up becoming a more fragile situation than ours, even though we pass on wide receivers in the first two rounds. Yeah. I mean, and Kittle technically is, I mean, Sean loves going early round tight end. So Kittle's very much still part of the zero running back. Like we, we did kind of a class, we did a classic modified zero running back. Everyone hates it, but that's, I mean, we took the strategy that we wanted to do right zero running back just hammer wide receivers throughout all the high leverage portions of the draft we tack one running back onto it so call it whatever you want hero anchor whatever it is but it's still like very much true to the idea of we are going to try to win the flex with wide receivers and we are respecting these bus rates and we're not going to get tied to projected points so much And i mean you look at the wide receiver selections i actually wanted to talk to you about this kind of to recap what we did here but you know we we thought very, very hard about going DJ Moore. If Amari Cooper goes at the turn, we'd also thought about T. Higgins instead of Mike Evans. Um, eventually decided to wait and see if we could maybe get T. Higgins coming back to us. Obviously, he didn't get there. But, like, Mike Evans wasn't really our first choice there. DJ Moore was. But for the most part, we're looking at guys who have really, really big ceilings and a lot of breakout guys. Ayuk, Claypool, Chenault, Elijah, 
Bateman. We're going for like these really big ceilings. So even within the structure, we're still not really betting on projections. We're betting on breakouts. We're betting on guys overperforming what you can even really project for them. Yeah. And uh, when I say what that right now, I think running back tight ends, the dominant start, that's still provided that you're able to get a Kelsey wall or Kittle. Like that's not applicable if you're not able to get one of those three guys. So, and the running back who fits and the running back who fits. So to me, that's like in an ideal world, it was who was the team. Oh yeah. We're in the main event with uh Gormanji right now And the team started out Kelsey, uh, Clyde Edwards Hilaire, which is like the perfect marriage for that start. And then he's able to come back around in the third and get an elite wide receiver too. So we are going to have plenty of exposure to these elite wide receivers. I think maybe the, maybe to kind of, you know, clarify my point would be, I think it's hard to start wide receiver, wide receiver in these rooms. I feel like you either want the anchor running back, or you want the tight end with one of those picks. Yeah. And I'm completely happy having a Devonte Adams, you know, Antonio Gibson start or whatever, or a yeah. Tyree kill George Kittle start. But it's when you're having to reach for your first at one of those running back or tight end positions, when the room is racing to fill their flex with those positions, mm-hmm. you're going to be hemorrhaging value by the time you actually need to draft those players. Yeah. Jay's commenting, and I actually don't know if he's saying we're fragile or not, but he said it's a small field and you need to make the playoffs, need more stability. In football, guys, you can be more fragile, which I agree with, but I think, I I guess I'm curious, Jay, if you're thinking about the same way. Like, to me, the fragility comes in with the running backs. Like, if you have um, Saquon Barkley, Aaron Jones, DeAndre Swift, that's actually quite a fragile start, right? That's why hyper fragile strategy is where you take three to four running backs, usually four. But you're, the fragility that that's referencing is in actually the the running back portion of it. So, in a field like football, guys, I do agree. I think I'd be more tempted to do the Dalvin Cook, Clyde Edwards, Elaire. I wouldn't go Sanders, but with the idea, hey, if Cook is the guy you needed and Ceh is the guy you needed this year in a bigger field like that, I can build around that with enough wide receiver firepower and create a monster. So. I agree, but I, I guess I'm curious if if you're thinking through that the same way. To me, the safety and kind of the – if you're just kind of looking to advance this team, it's in dominating the flex positions. And so the safer approach is just to take as many shots as you can to make sure you have the flexes smashing, and then you can sort of figure it out from there. That you, I think you maybe run the risk of – you know, not having enough upside at the running back positions to take down the whole thing if things don't break for you. Um, but, you know, things certainly can break like we saw here with Daryl Henderson in the 10th. Yeah, I mean, the whole point, I mean, you you literally wrote the article on this. There's only a couple of these guys that are going to have the legendary running back season. And maybe not even a couple, maybe it's just one. So when you're using three running back spots on that, yes, you're increasing your odds to hit on that one guy, but it's still an incredibly fragile bet to make because it's very unlikely that you're going to get multiple legendary seasons when you could get multiple legendary seasons from a a running back, a wide receiver start or a wide receiver tight end start. Like you can get those ceiling games or seasons. The thing too is like, when you just look back at the past seasons, like we, we had like one in 2019 from McCaffrey, who's the 102 or the 101. And so if you just think like through the probabilities that there's like there happened to be two guys this year and they also happen to be going in such a way that you can draft them back to back, like just the odds of that in a given season are already pretty low. So you're more likely, what's more likely happening is if that team's succeeding is that like, let's say Dalvin cook has a good, but not great season. Like he, he kind of, he has like 20 points per game. He's really solid. Kind of like what we saw from Derek coming last year. He's really helping you, but he's not delivering like that gigantic legendary season, like a 2019 Christian McCaffrey. And then maybe CEH is the guy. And in that case, you're, you're still really set up, but you could accomplish that too with a digs um, instead of the cook. So it's, I, I think it is a giant, it's a pretty big swing when you're swinging for, uh, the double running back start and it can it can definitely pay off but I think it might be even like like a higher upside play than you might really need 
Yeah. Um, Dan asking here is your ideal spot number two, Kelsey plus RB. So looking at team three, this is from our slow draft that we're doing with uh, Matt Gorman right now from the Discord. I mean, I, I don't, in this build, I don't think Pat and I take ETN here. We keep pissing yellow, but man, this start when you can do the Kelsey, CEH, AJ Brown, Higgins, Ayuk start, I mean, that to me looks like a dominant start. Yeah, that's awesome. I don't think I tack on ETN there. I don't, I mean, it's fine, but, um, but yeah, we'd probably build that out as similarly like we did in our one main and our first main and take another, like we, we take Ayuk, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And this actually, this was an interesting, uh, spot for us here. So we had a situation when we were on the clock at what would it have been four, nine. And mm -hmm. we, our favorite player on the board was Higgins, but based on ADP and where he's been going, we thought there was a really good chance that Higgins comes back and, and we were able to, to get both Godwin and Higgins. So we tried to play the ADP game there. We go Godwin Higgins gets snapped up right away. Uh, and we had even mentioned Julio Jones, maybe as a target in the fifth, we had mentioned uh, potentially taking uh an ETN there and they, and they all go off the board, just bam, bam, bam. Yeah, that was, um, yeah, Julio Jones. It was Julio Jones and T Higgins who we were looking yeah. at, which Ayuk's great. We have, we have Kittle too. So we're already invested in San Francisco. So it makes sense. But, um, God T we just, I just feel like we cannot catch a break with T like it, I, I don't know that. I mean, <laughs> last year, you know, it's like, hey, let's go grab our guys, and we grab too much of you know Jalen Rager and, and stuff. But um, we got just the right amount of Rojo. But you know, looking at T, it's like, do we are we going to be able to get enough exposure? Like every time we go to draft them, someone else swoops in and gets them first. Yeah, and I, I know this isn't like the fun thing to do. And uh, I was even talking to Davis today about how I have far less individual player takes than you guys. But when I see this stuff, like. If, if you tell me like, okay, I have one draft, like, yes, I, I want, I've, I've probably been splitting. I, I, I take Julio before him on underdog, but I never get Julio because another drafter takes him. And then I always end up with Ayuk. But I guess the point I'm making is Julio and Ayuk completely different players in different situations right now. I don't have a super strong conviction on one or the other i think Ayuk has more room to be a second round pick next year than julio uh so i lean in that direction but i guess the point i'm making is like i never have so much conviction on any of these as much as i like t higgins we're talking about higgins versus chase like i do prefer higgins but i, I could be chase like I, I don't know these are all such close bets there's a reason their adp is so so close to each other yeah and we i mean Chris is pointing out we have a ton of Kittle and IU. And I feel better about the Kittle side of that because, like, Kittle, Kittle's had 18 points in tight end premium for three straight seasons, 18 points per game. And I think his situation is about to drastically improve. He's never scored more than five touchdowns. He's had 18 points per game in three straight seasons, never scored more than five touchdowns. Like, the upside on Kittle, I know, you know, they're not going to throw enough. And you know, he could get in the end zone, like – 12 times you know like it could be pretty nice and i actually think that you know this this offense could just be scoring a ton of points like that that might not even be um enough upside given how efficient that he can be um and also maybe lance does take you know five six games and they throw a little bit more than people think so kittle with the just because i think he's such a such a talented player in such a good situation and gives you such a construction edge I'm okay if Kittle is like one of the landmines, to be honest. Like yeah. he just, he's a guy like that we want, we want to be overexposed to. And this just perfectly illustrates my point about the specific player takes. Isn't, isn't Kittle overvalued? So, you know, he's going, or I guess in this draft, he actually slipped uh, further past ADP. But the whole point is it's not necessarily that we are obsessed with Kittle as a player. It's that we are obsessed with what he does for your structure. We put him in the tier. He's the last and the cheapest of the elite tight ends, which unlock a specific structure that we think is very conducive 
to winning in FFPC. It honestly has nothing to do with Kittle. I, I could give you shits if he's like three picks overvalued. If it, it like does not matter, we are aiming to fill a structure with these drafts. Yeah. And I, I think that Kittle isn't overvalued. I guess that's the other thing. I mean, he was pretty close 18.6 points per game to 20.8 for Waller last year. Um, like he, he's pretty close. And the situation, I think, could be much, much stronger. Like the overall offensive situation could be much stronger. It's not going to be like an ultra high volume situation, but it could be a highly efficient and high scoring situation. Again, we've never had touchdown upside with this guy. Like, our, was the Mullins comment like that somehow Kittle is like a product of Mullins? Like, he's not. He's. I think he's the best tight end in the league. He's not a product of any of the crappy quarterbacks that have been thrown to him. And if Lance is good, he has a gigantic ceiling. So I think, you know, it's not – and also, like, we're not having to take him over Darren Waller. We're getting – he's going over a round after Darren Waller. So, you know, I I think we're we're getting, like, an appropriate discount. Although we have take, – we we've taken him at the 202. So – but, you know, we were in that situation at the 111. We would have taken Waller at the 111, not Kittle. So – it's not like we're making a gigantic stand on on Kittle. It's just kind of where he's going. Yeah, if anything, I, I agree. I think Waller's the one that's overvalued. I think Waller and Kittle should be very similar, but you're paying uh, almost round premium because of Waller's production from last year. Uh, and because Kittle was kind of out of sight, out of mind, you're getting a discount on him. Right. Which is which is how fantasy drafts work. Like Almost all of these ADPs are largely influenced by what happened last year. Yep. Um, yep. Sam had a question here. Uh, if we considered ever changing our team names, I mean, Sam, we, we made our, our bet uh, or, or sold our souls to the devil a long time ago. We, we say every one of our thoughts <laughs> about what we think we say, the players we like, we live stream our drafts in real time. We had, we were releasing <laughs> episodes of the picks and the people who were one spot behind us were listening to the episodes. And that's why we're going on their show. Cause they're like, we like your apps where we, you told us all your thoughts. <laughs> we, did a main, we did a main event draft a couple of years ago with Scott Connor. And he was literally listening to our episodes at the table <laughs> during the draft. The draft during, or, yeah. <laughs> during the draft. So yeah, no, we don't, we don't give a shit. Go yeah, ahead. The name is not the problem. Yeah, yeah. That's not where we're giving away the edge. Yeah. Yeah. Sam, that's the point. We don't. We don't care. We uh, come come after ship chasing, please. Um, but also, I honestly don't. I mean, we're we're generally doing. We're going against the grain in in some ways in a lot of these drafts. So I, I don't know. I, I don't think it's really hurting us to be honest. I think, and a lot of these guys like they have a plan. They're executing their own plan. Like I think in some ways they might know like oh those those dudes are obsessed with DJ Moore or whatever, and you know they're gonna go ahead and grab DJ Moore. Um, you know, maybe right before us on a wrap or something. So that yeah. maybe that hurts us, but um, that would be a fairly specific example. But and again, it goes back to my point. We have these guys we like. We like T. Higgins. We're bummed we didn't get both of them. The T. Higgins probability bet of versus Chris Godwin is not a. There's not a big difference. Maybe we like him 52 to 48 percent. We're bummed out because of that extra two percent. But they aren't a different probability bet if they were we would have taken higgins before right like right that right. that's that's what it boils down to so i don't know it's fun to really <laughs> like players but at the end of the day we're not actually good at predicting these things so it's not a big deal um yeah i mean and we want our guys but i think in a situation too like with godwin like I, we don't have godwin we actually have evans on another team and we gave ourselves a chance to get higgins at a really nice price and i this has so far been a disaster. Like we did, we try to do this with more. We try to do this with Higgins. We try to do the CD lamb. We're like, it's like, let's give ourselves the chance to get the super team. And so far the room has not handed us the super team, but I feel like that's still something you want to do, you know? And it's going to give us our whole issue last year was slamming our guys over and over too much Rager, too much Zach Moss. This is going to give us natural diversification. You want to snipe us on our brand, guys? Go for it. We probably need it. So yeah, we, we could diversify. use it at this point. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> like who likes I, Brandon Ayuk? Go ahead and take yeah, him, please. Someone take. I can't Chase help Claypool. myself. Yeah, someone take Chase Claypool so we can take Odell Beckham. Like I, I want some Odell Beckham shares. Like that, they're all the same yeah. probability bets. Um, uh, well, also, hang on. Can you bring up um, Clay's comment here? The, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, man. And then Frank had a comment that I thought was interesting um, about Andrews. Yes, I wanted to. That was the one I was going to. To me, I was going to say this goes back to our thing in a perfect world. If you knew that he was going to be there, you would make those two V2s. Mm -hmm. But there is no guarantee that Andrews is going to be there. And that's why these guys, when you see Hawkinson get pushed up in this draft, this is an extremely palatable price. Like we were we were really bummed um, with this 2v2 in retrospect because I think we would have gone Calvin Ridley in Mark Andrews yeah. had we known. I agree. So, I agree with this point. There. If we knew that Andrews, like if Andrews ADP was like, I mean, he's more like more mid fourth, right? Yeah. He's not, it, it would have been tough to count on him. And I guess, you know, maybe Frank would argue that you should kind of like I was saying, like, you know, let the room give you the super team. You should be allowing the chance for that 2v2 to exist where you go ahead and pass on Kittle and uh, and take Ridley and, you know, let Andrews come back to you. I, I think that would work better on the other side of the board where, like, Kittle coming back here is, like, pretty ridiculous value. But when you're taking Kittle over, you know, Devontae, um, you know, like, one of, like, Devontae or Diggs potentially, uh, depending on, how that ADP shakes out. But let's say you had the 2 0, let's say you had the 112. You know, at that point, yeah, maybe you do play for Andrews to come back um, and you can grab him. But even then, what, you got to grab him at the 401. So it's it's tough. It's, it's just like, I, I want I, I want Andrews to be a little bit cheaper than he is, is what is really what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. And again, I do think you're, you're paying a little bit to have that that flexibility and not get because there are scenarios in this draft where Pitts, Hawkinson and Mark Andrews all go in the third, like that's going to happen in some of these drafts. If there's a few teams that all want their tight end, like those guys will go there. And then you get in the weird territory where I found in the pros versus Joe's, I found a nice price point where I was happy with Noah Fant, but it starts to be this thing where all of them are pushed up like a round and a half, two rounds ahead of where they should go. And then it's like, okay, are you going to sacrifice two rounds of value now because you gambled on your structure and now you right. don't want to have to use three roster spots on late tight ends? Right. And the other thing with, you know, the cranking of purple definitely can work, but it is a, it is something I'd rather do in best ball where, like, I want, I want more roster spots to churn. And so while it can work, it's, it's nice just to have like this one roster spot that's a starting spot for George Kittle. And then we probably end up with like another spot on the bench devoted to tight end, but we're not burning two of those and potentially three of those as we kind of churn through and look for guys over the course of the season. Uh, there was a comment here yeah. about, Oh, good. I, yeah, I just wanted to do this comment real quick. So this team we are co-managing with Matt Gorman from the discord. So, uh, and we should probably be able when we pull up these teams to make sure you guys know that. So when Pat and I did the slow draft, that was just me and Pat, the, the other one on the full board. And we did the mini sods on it. This one we're working with Matt on, and we're trying to draft a team that both Matt is excited about. And, and we think is particularly sharp and well-structured. So Matt was extremely high on digs. He didn't feel comfortable with the running backs that were going in this range. And we talked it through. He preferred digs to Hill we didn't see any issue with going for digs here. And so that's why you get uh, a build that looks different. And it also goes back to Pat and I have no problem with this spot. I think uh, both Sean and Gretch have digs as their number four. I think maybe Gretch and, and them are flipped on Tyree kill, but I think, I think Sean has Hill number four and Gretch has digs. Yeah. But same. But, yes. Yeah. And just the, it goes back to that thing too from the question earlier. You guys worried you're going to have no exposure to the elite wide receivers. Like doing builds like this that are still smart that give you access to different textures of boards. Like 
you know, I don't think it's a huge concern, but Pat, like most of the dig shares are going to be from the backside of the board, the 11 and the 12, like having a digs team where you get lamb, like there probably aren't going to be a lot of digs lamb teams. There's, there's not going to be a lot of digs lamb teams. Yeah. yeah. That'll be kind of interesting. Which See, yeah, Jay's and- saying is not very plus EV, but I think it would be plus EV. I mean, you got to advance, you got to advance, but I mean, it's leverage on the field if you can get, you know, some of these studs in, if studs are unique combinations, I think it would just sort of intuitively help you a little bit. Well, and I don't, I think the unique build is honestly just a bonus. That's not why we did it. The, yeah, the yeah. point is, is in a perfectly efficient market, Diggs and Hill are the fourth and fifth pick in this draft. These picks are chasing the legendary upside that we know Christian McCaffrey and Dalvin Cook have exhibited, but there are legit question marks that Zeke and Kamara and JT and Henry and Barkley can match that and gibson and you know i love gibson but gibson definitely has that question mark too so yeah i think um you know this this whole range i think we get like really anchored to adp within this range and it's all kind of like what you're trying to do in that specific draft and the other thing is i really love drafting with co-owners like pete and i've been drafting together since we started doing high stakes drafts like you know whatever three four years ago and doing the one with crack rock last year was like really kind of eye-opening like how helpful it can be just to like get some you know get some other opinions and get you know get off into you know maybe some targets that actually are really good targets but you know that you wouldn't have probably gotten onto without some additional input i think it's actually extremely valuable and kind of mixes it up a little bit so like if you're taking well it probably feels weird to take a guy who you feel like I could get him at the the 111 or whatever at the 104. I don't think there's that big of a difference. We're just not that good at predicting who's actually going to be the hits within the first round. Like you don't see this hyper efficient market in the first round of these drafts really in any format. So I think it's totally fine um, to from your draft slot decide, you know what? I, I want to go with the early wide receiver here. Who cares what the ADP says? I do really think the ADP stuff, like you said, in these first couple rounds, and you see it a lot on underdog with the ADPs in the app is it's just our lizard brains kicking in and feeling like we have to color within the lines and, Oh, something falls out of it. Oh my God. We just got an insane deal or, Oh, I can't reach because the number is four, you know, you know, ticks ahead. Like it really does not matter. Like if you're thinking in ranges of probability bets, all of these picks in the first two rounds at their specific positions have similar probability bet. So I, I don't really get hung up on that at all. Yeah. Especially if like, you know, you're in a situation where like we wanted to do, we have this structure, we wanted to go with the wide receiver and potentially the tight end structure. I mean, the other thing is who, who would people have had less of an issue with Waller? If we take Waller at the one four, you know, People would say that was a reach, but it's not nearly as like big of a reach, right? As to take digs, but we got Kittle. So, you know, in retrospect, I'm pretty pretty excited we didn't go ahead and take Waller. Um, but yeah, with within this structure, this is where we wanted to go. And we'll play the ADP game. Like we we grabbed Chris Godwin, who fell to us. Like I think as ADP value kind of falls to you later that fits your structure, that's a good way to mix up your exposures. Um, but I don't think I want to like dictate my structure of the draft based on the ADP. If I really feel like I want to go a different way or one of the co-owners feels that way. Yeah. A couple questions here about um, exposures and how many drafts we're going to be doing. So I believe we're going to be up to 14 main event yeah, I mean, drafts. 14 main events. Yeah. Yeah. And so I, I mean, I think we will think about exposure and we will have both kind of, by feel we're going to, we're going to know who we've been taking a ton of. And also like Pat said, by working with different co-managers, we're going to be doing a couple with Gretch. We're going to do one with Davis. We're doing one with other co-managers. Everyone's going to have their flavor and their Sean, preference. We're doing one with Sean and Gretch. We're, we're doing one with Sean. And I think that's, what's fun. Like in it, this kind of goes to the DFS thing too, right? Where everyone's like, you got to play this guy. And it's like, Oh no, I want, I want to play this guy. This is my guy. Great. Put the guy in your lineup that you absolutely love, and we will build a smart correlated lineup around it. You have your guy that you want in the main event draft. You absolutely want to get A.J. Dillon. We can make that work and build a smart team around that structure, right? Yep, exactly. 
So I, I think the exposures and stuff will get natural diversification just based on who we're drafting, how we're drafting. Dan would probably actually be able to answer this question more than us. Like, I I would assume so that the slow drafts are tougher. I definitely know that from underdog too. I, I But I think there's a balancing with it too because I think getting to really think through your structure and some of these decisions also makes your team better than it would in fast drafts. Yeah. You th- wait, you think the – so I zoned out reading Josh's comment saying he, he didn't get a shout-out. <laughs> yes. Uh, everyone Sorry, Josh. Everyone who, who, who does a co-managed team will eventually get a shout-out, but we haven't drafted our team yet, Josh, and you will get it. Um, <laughs> yeah. No, I'm saying there's pros and cons, and I think it might ultimately balance out. I think you get more values, more people panicking, guys falling, mm-hmm. uh, probably less player-efficient and structure-efficient things, but I think – it also balances out really getting to think through things during a slow draft. Yeah, I think it. you're more efficient too. And like we thought through a couple things where I feel like we landed on, on better picks sometimes. Although, I don't know, like with, with the first draft, I was looking like, uh, do, how do you feel about the decision ultimately to take Amari Cooper? Because I listened back to that episode today and we're like, um, we were looking at Amari Cooper and DJ Moore, and you were you were saying, "Hey, I'm pretty hyped on T. Higgins, and I think maybe we could go T. Higgins here in the fifth. And I never asked you, do you just straight up prefer T. Higgins to Amari Cooper? And I think that was like the key question, and I still don't really know. Like, would you have rather had just in a vacuum T. Higgins or Amari Cooper on that team? Um, yeah, in a vacuum, uh, sponsored by uh, Dyson. Uh, yeah, one team, give me Higgins. The other thing that changed too, is like, I, I know on that mini I had brought up his ankle and I had pulled up the Roto yeah. World blurb, but we actually got more information since then that I think even makes that decision a little bit easier, uh, in yeah. hindsight. But at the time, I think it was super, super close. Yeah. I think we should have taken DJ more in yes. retrospect because not be, you know, not because we got sniped, because I think we would have gotten sniped on Cooper, but I think it's it's kind of clear that if we like we had a stronger the guy we really wanted was DJ Moore, and it's probably like a pretty tight between Cooper and Higgins anyway, so we should have just taken more. Um, the issue with this jet, if there were, uh, if you can point me into the direction of a main event fast draft, we can do uh, now please do. I haven't been able to find that on the site. So we want to keep drafting. And so main event slow drafts are the only thing we can do. We're drafting 14 total teams. Pat and I barely have a single night uh, free once uh, main uh, main event drafts kick off live around August 20th. So it's more a scheduling thing. Um, We like making content about the main events. And the only way to do that right now is slow draft. Yeah. Um, We've got more coming. We're going to do, be doing a slow draft, uh, I don't know, in the next week or two. When we enter the slow drafts, we are entering starts win full six hour clock. Yes. And we're going to be entering in one with Gretch probably this weekend. Um, Are you in every slow draft? No, we're not in every slow draft. We have, we're going to join two more slow drafts probably over the course of the next two weeks. Um, Let's see here. Yes, the vacuum jokes suck. We do need to clean it up, Pat. <laughs> uh, <Hold on. laughs> um, let me pull up another board. Let's pull up our uh, Penta managed team here because that also, uh, again, it goes back to wanting to do a bunch of these because, again, right after we had finished our first main event draft with from the 11 hole, we drew another 11. We got another there. 11, yeah. And we did <laughs> s- something pretty similar. It's Got another Kittle similar. share. You guys are <laughs> the exposure. The exposure questions are going to keep coming in because the first three mains are pretty similar. Yes, some, they they players. are going to come in. Although on this one we did we did go with a quarterback here. So again from the eleven, Saquon Kittle, another Amari, uh, DJ Moore, Ayuk, Lamar, Visca, Boyd, Bink, Henderson, Waddle, Singletary, Bateman. Rager uh very very similar construction here uh 
what what were your your overall thoughts when this one finished, Pat? Yeah, I thought the I mean the Saquon one is the is the real question of what do we get out of him? I think the unfortunate part of Saquon is that you'll probably see his ADP slip. And so, you know, to take him at the 111 feels like, you know, maybe you'll end up getting him now in the 202, 203 range. I mean, he's slipping a little bit in underdog, right? So, um, but I don't know. I don't think he's going to fall too, too much. Um, and 111 feels pretty palatable, even given what we know. Um, the ceiling case for him has not changed. He's still got the chance to have once he's fully up to speed, seven plus targets per game, getting all the goal line work, you know, getting enough uh, on the ground as well to just explode down the stretch. And I think that can start as early as like week week, week three or week four. So, um, but in general, I'm happy to have the elite uh, quarterback on this one, which we didn't have in the first main event build. We got Lance and Fields in the other one, which obviously could be a problem if uh, we don't have a, a week one starter, but you do get a preseason run, so we'll kind of play that by ear, adjust uh, and drop one of the, the late round dart throw guys if we need to. But here, getting Lamar Jackson, and then we do get my guy Bateman to go with him. That was uh, that was pretty nice. I really liked that. Uh, man, you guys have all kinds of questions. Um these are managed leagues. These are managed leagues. Um, someone was asking, uh, Pat and I, I don't think, I believe all of our, I don't think we're doing, unless you're, you're doing a main event behind my back, uh, we're doing all of our main event drafts together this year. Doing all the main events together. That's right. We're a package deal, Jarrett. Um, you going to post the main event, the mains you fire live. Of course, we're streaming yeah. them. We will that's be what this whole show is. <laughs> This literally, this show was founded on the principles of streaming our drafts. It's it's why we're here. That's why we're uh, here. Yes, we will be streaming. Uh, there's a stretch in August, and I'm gonna get a, a a calendar graphic out just so people know. But there's a stretch where we're doing five main event live drafts within five days. So, yeah, if you Pete's guys panicking a little bit. I'm taking it in a stride. I found out today that I might be moving uh, on what? September 1st. Yeah, I might have to move. Why? Because my landlord is trying to uh, increase my rent beyond what I think is appropriate. Wow. That would, I mean, if you get better internet, it could be a win win. <laughs> Pete's rooting for it. Are you in contact with my landlord? <laughs> yeah. I, I got to get you to somewhere with better internet. Um, uh, the, uh, I wanted to get Henry's question, or it's a, well, I guess it is technically a question Minnesota defense question mark. How are you playing these, Henry, in terms of the defenses? Because, like, basically, what we do is we look at the week one and two schedule, pick a pick one of the remaining defenses that looks pretty good, and then play. You know, we're going to be streaming the entire year. So I don't know. I mean, I've never been able to stomach taking a defense really before the second to last round. But are there are there better defenses that are cheap that you've been targeting? Yeah, I um if yeah. if someone has very strong defensive takes, now is the time to share them. Yeah, I did uh I did DM uh Denny and asked him about kickers. Uh that's how we got I believe that's how we got on Matt Gay here. Um hey Hen see Henry's on team elite D and kicker. We we will wave at you from across the street uh over there. Well, you know, Blair is too. So maybe. It maybe Blair, on, uh, isn't Blair just elite kicker? Yeah, I don't know how he feels about elite defense, actually. He's definitely elite kicker. He's a huge Justin Fuck <laughs> Justin Tucker. I said, what did you say, Pat? Well, I, said, I believe I said Justin Fucker, but I didn't mean to. The Piss Boys. We're drafting Justin Fucker. <laughs> Who knows what they'll say? <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> um, let's see. Yes. Mike, we are we are registered. We are registered, guys. We we are on top of things. Who, like, why is my former podcast trolling me in here? <laughs> yeah, the, <laughs> the only thing Leone's biggest gripe with this team is that we didn't draft Mike Davis on it. Like, how do you take Lamar Jackson over Mike Davis? Yeah, <laughs> clearly um, playing for floor, not ceiling with that selection. 
this is just a Q and A stream now. Can someone tell me what that Daigle video was about yesterday? Daigle is a nomad who, for a large chunk of last year, lived with Evan Silva. He since went on the road for a few months, and now the prodigal son has returned home to make Evan Silva dinner and take care of his daughter while he watches all the games on Game Pass. That's how I understand it. Daigle apparently is a phenomenal cook. I know. I need to get him to move in over here. Um. Okay. Keep just yeah. This will be a this will be a Q and A pod. If you have questions, just fire well, them. While we're waiting for anyone who missed it on uh, on good old NBC Sports Edge, a good football show. <laughs> we did have the we did have the the fight, the long awaited fight between me and Daigle. Pete was the judge. Leone was the judge. I feel pretty good about that fight. That I think was it went, I think it went pretty well. So was it was day it was daigle's idea like the premise of the show was daigle's idea but then he tasked you with picking the judges uh yeah so i i had mentioned leone and i and i think there was an assumption that denny would be involved but denny wasn't available i i suggest you i, I was, was a good denny choice Phillip. you were you were denny Phillip, and my god i couldn't have chosen better <laughs> <laughs> the first 3v1 boxing <laughs> match in history so um, I feel like we've yeah. been getting lots of questions about like exposures and starts. I mentioned the, the Kelsey CEH start being one that I think would be very fun from like the three or the four hole. If you could pull it off, what are some of your other kind of dream constructions or it could be player specific or structure one that you hope we stumble upon at some point? Christian McCaffrey. Yeah. I, w I would love to get a one-on-one. Because I think, like to me though, and I and I believe um, we had a comment like right at the beginning of the show about you know if you can take a like if like in this situation with the McCaffrey team, you know he's got his running back two spot filled, and then he's got his you know his running back three spot filled in the flex, and so basically then he's filling two wide receiver spots and. You know, you're basically just trying to piece together that last flex. And like, I get that, but our bet is that basically the wide receivers are going to score more points. And I think that once you factor in the bust rates and the ability to actually hit on enough of these picks to be filling all of the starting roster spots with players who are scoring a bunch of points, that we want to be thinking of that flex spot is a wide receiver spot, not as a potential spot for a running back. We filled those flex spots actually with running backs more than we would like to because we're always looking for running backs off the waiver wire. We're taking a lot of late round stabs on running backs. So we actually often are flexing running backs, but I almost feel that as kind of like a failure. Like we, we almost, we didn't hit enough wide receivers. Like our wide receiver picks got hurt or we, you know, picks the wrong guys or we frankly just didn't take enough of them so that's kind of what we're going for to fill the wide receiver with the flex spot which i think ultimately once you actually get down to it once you factor in the bust rates once you factor in that a lot of these running backs are scoring pretty replaceable levels of points you're going to get more points out of the stud wide receivers in those flex spots than you are going to be able to out of most of these running backs not that you can't do it it's just it's like a i feel like it's a much higher bar that you have to clear Number seven team here feeling dangerous. He's been in lots of our drafts. Um, he's a sharp drafter, and I feel like he builds like the the smarter uh, FFPC drafters do with the double running back start. You take the, the detour, normally either for a tight end there or your third running back, but you see him loading up on these wide receivers. I feel like he sniped us on on CD and, and Higgins in multiple drafts uh, already. But I feel like this is the classic FFPC structure that's still like doing the running back heavy start in a smart way. Agreed. Yeah. This is a pretty like standard, like sharp FFPC style draft, I think. And he's yeah. also swinging for the fences as well. Like he's getting CD, he's getting Higgins. I think Galladay is actually kind of a high upside pick, even though, I, it could definitely fail because of that offense, but he's a good player, you know? So um, Elijah Moore, high upside guy, DJ Shark, high upside guy, Rondale Moore. So all of his wide receiver guys are actually quite high upside picks. 
Um, I think Godwin's maybe kind of in that that middle range, but it's a decent price on Godwin. So um, I, I think it's not just about like what positions were taken in each round as well. I think the player archetypes um, really fit with like, he didn't go wide receiver, wide receiver, but then he's like swinging for the fences and, and really prioritizing the upside profiles at the wide receiver, which makes sense within this bill. So Kyle, we were actually in this exact same spot last year when we had one of our main event drafts and we started McCaffrey and then Aaron Jones fell all the way to two. I mean, we were prepared to just completely piss yellow after C-Mac and we did take Aaron Jones in that build. Um, I could definitely, I think it, in our first few drafts, I think if we got a 101, I think we're, we're just going to piss it straight through. But I could see later in draft season, mixing it up there if if a guy like that fell like a c max ceh start where you're giving your chance at the two top two running backs on the year is is a pretty enticing start too especially if you're looking at ceh versus nick chubb and Najee harris instead of ceh versus dk metcalf and aj brown you know like i'm just not going to be able to pass on dk metcalf and aj brown there um, I could maybe pass on Keenan Allen for a CEH or, you know, maybe I, I grab Keenan Allen at the 301 Metcalf, AJ Brown are gone and it's CEH Allen like that. I could be more on board with, but it, the wide receiver ADPs I think would have to change a little bit for me to find that appealing because I already have the CEH there. If I, if I had Kelsey, then now we're talking about that kind of one elite running back build and offering you a little bit more flexibility later, not have to chase running backs. That would be the the one I find more appealing, not to pair him with McCaffrey necessarily, given the wide receiver eighty piece. So this is a good question from Raceff and something we when we did our pre draft call with uh, Matt on that other draft that we were showing earlier, where we threw five rounds. We were looking at one of his other drafts where he had taken it was like Nico Collins, Deami Brown, and there was one other kind of upside wide receiver he had taken a, a dart on and to me those guys would really mu come into play in a build where you started out with those two running backs early and you're really needing to get a few more cracks at high upside wide receivers late my issue with this is if you have seven or eight wide receivers early those guys you're not cutting them unless they get hurt and so then you're taking flyers on wide receivers like the guys I just lifted, listed. You're not going to get immediate information on their role or how good they are. Like it could be weeks until we know about De'Ami Brown. It could be months until we know about Nico Collins. Sure, they could flash early, but I think you're going to end up just burning those roster spots or churning them on running backs so early that I just wonder if it's even worth it getting the week one peak in the first place. So I, I actually disagree a little bit where like Nico Collins, I think we could learn about quickly. Like he could ultimately, and we could learn soon. Like we could start getting like the same reports that we were getting about McLaren, where he's like, Nico Collins is a starter for this team. I, I don't know if we will, obviously, but that's certainly on the table. And then I actually think that there is other guys like, um, like an Aguilar, you know, or like, I don't like Aguilar at all. I like, you know, Jacoby, if he was kind of where Aguilar went here, like there are guys that you could take a stab on that we will get information about. Paris Campbell would be another guy like we'll get information about Paris Campbell. And he is a guy that you'd be OK cutting a week or two into the season. So I agree more on your point with like Diami. Terrace Marshall is another guy like I don't want to be overloaded with the Diamis and the Terrace Marshalls and the Rashad Bateman and the Elijah Moore, because I think you're going to be holding on to them for a long time. But my point is that's the second prong of the two prongs. The other is that you have Amari Cooper, DJ Moore, Brandon Ayuk, LaVisca Chenault, Tyler Boyd, Jalen Waddle, Rashad Bateman, Jalen Rager. Even if they flash a little bit, they're not cracking your lineup ever. And then they just become a roster clogger that you feel you can't move on to because they're getting six targets a game. Yeah, I, I, Paris Campbell, I think, might be an exception though. Like you could, I could imagine Paris Campbell easily outscoring Lavisca Chanel in some scenarios. Oh, but you know? that's so. that's not what I mean because Paris Campbell went close to where Rager. I'm talking yeah, late. Yeah. You're talking like, late, Amigo, late. Collins, like yeah. I just 
with the way we build, it's just very hard for me to envision taking a Nico Collins unless we did what the one team did where you start not the three, but you start with two running backs. And then maybe there's an insane value. Maybe Javante Williams falls to the six. And you're like, all right, we're going to crank some green here. Uh, let's let's then try to backfill with some of these upside shots we like. Yeah, I, I guess I, I'm still a little bit more open to the Nico one just because like that starting lineup is just, we just don't know anything like like who's going to be the other outside starting wide receiver there is it chris conley is it it could be nico so yeah um, but how many wide receivers do you have on your team when you like he makes a ton of sense on this build the guy only has four right. wide receivers through 13 rounds but i mean we know like we've built very very wide receiver heavy for years and we still end up bidding for Michael Pittman and getting Chase Claypool and getting T Higgins and, you know, getting all these guys off the waivers as they're emerging because the reason we draft so wide receiver heavy in the first place is, is because like, we're probably wrong about 40% of the wide receivers that we selected, whether it's through injury or they're just not quite as high scoring as we were hoping. So I still think that it actually can make sense within the idea that you don't, I do think the biggest thing is you do not want to, clog a bunch of roster spots so like here we have waddle and bateman i think rager is the guy that like it's nice that we have rager there instead of like um terrace because rager we're going to know i think a lot sooner if he's playing better this year and it's going to be you know pretty heavily targeted or not like rager's a guy that's more easy to move on from than a terrace so that's the i think the main concern is how many roster clogger uh, type guys where you're not going to get early information do you have yeah and the e and even the the information isn't created equal the information you get about running back touches and and right. snaps is is just so much different than the uh wide receiver usage which could still have a lot more variance and take weeks to kind of understand if it was you know random or not true true but like with a nico for example like if he's running you know, 70% of routes, um, that would be pretty big. Like, you know, even if he gets one target, you'd be like, all right, well, we might have something here. Um, and we have learned something, something somewhat important. So, and the other thing is like when you, we know that as much as I love Ty Johnson, I've talked to Chad Johnson, JV and Hawkins, Malcolm Brown, like we know the odds of any one of these scratch off running backs being worth anything. Like we're going to be churning them so quickly. So I think, I think it's fine if you think as long as you think that there's new information coming on that guy and they have a really high ceiling. Uh oh. Look what the cat drug in. Oh boy. The world's preeminent Mike Davis lover. What's up, Mike? What's happening? Mike Davis, league winner. Get it right when you announce <laughs> his presence, please. I oh who my did God. you who were you debating in that pros versus Joe's where you took him? Um, debating. He had. He was in the only guy. Yeah, to beating like locked in, sweating bullets that he was going to last to me. <laughs> I was probably debating taking another receiver, which I think like if it, if it wasn't best ball, I would have taken another receiver. Yeah. Uh, any any thoughts on uh, our general discussions we're having? Well, I feel like I guess with taking Barkley early, it's a little differently. But if you're going zero RB or one RB early. I just think you want to like stash as many running backs as possible to get lucky. And then you're just absolutely hammering. Like you got what seven or eight, like if once you're to eight wide receivers, it just seems like, yeah, I don't, I don't like, I don't know. You've kind of maxed out. I get Pat's point. Like on Nico specifically where there's the information gain there might be like really different than some of the other guys. But for the most part, well, to be clear, like I was arguing for, Ty Hawkins or Ty <laughs> Ty Johnson and Javian Hawkins here, not for Nico Collins, but I get all I'm saying is I think it's okay. Like if you don't like those running backs, you want to grab a Nico. I think it's not like bad. Well, I don't think it's bad, but I'm just saying then you need to plot out where else in your structure then you're going to make that two v two because I do think it's bad if you already have nine wide receivers. You need to then flip one of those wide right. receivers for a running back stab in the middle rounds. Yeah, I guess I I'm saying he, I don't think you have to. I think you can get away with. I mean, we had we had eight, so he would be the ninth. Like, but I think like, you could make nine. Your team is a dumpster fire if Nico Collins is is getting in there. I don't think so, dude. I, I honestly don't think so. Like he's a big, athletic guy who could have 
a starting role. Like he's he I do think Nico Collins has like a, a really high ceiling. Like Terry McLaurin, like crushed right out of the gate. Like it, it wouldn't be crazy that Nico Collins is someone you're very happy that you drafted and are starting pretty quickly. Yeah, even in this just- build. It's yeah, it's just going back to I think we're arguing different things. You're arguing the player and I'm just arguing the structure. Like I have no opinions about Nico Collins. I'm just saying I don't think it makes sense with that structure. Yeah, I'm not I mean if you're taking John Brown over the running back, like, forget about it. That's dumb. Yeah, I think you want at least seven running backs, right? I mean, in managed in this I don't know, I think you want at least seven. I guess like this is a slow draft. I don't know at what point you realize you hit gold on Daryl Henderson and then that maybe would have changed things a little bit, but well, Pat and I were kind of talking about that too, where in hindsight, you you regret that with the information of knowing you being Darrell Henderson, because the way I think Pat and I view these drafts is like, we're, we're fine patching together running back two on the waiver wire with pass catching backs. Like that's the least important position. So when you bink Darrell Henderson as a guy, you feel comfortable in your, your first running back slot. Then it's like, man, I wish I could flop bar- swap Barkley to Diggs. Yeah. I don't yeah, want Barkley to one. Diggs or Adams is like, yeah, would look really sweet, but you obviously, but you can't know that ahead of time. And but then it, right. it goes back to that point we were talking about earlier about like the viability of zero RB in these drafts. And I do think then you do have to make it all the way to round nine before you're grabbing your first running back. Like you take the detour for Kittle, you take the detour for Lamar Jackson, you make sure you're grabbing the Visca, the Boyd. And then finally there's like a little tear break and you like the Henderson Pollard, AJ guy. That's where you're grabbing your first running back. Right. Yeah. I think you got to have the stomach. Yeah, I, I know you guys think I love RBs, but I got the stomach for that. I we got I got to do a main event with you guys, and we go full zero RB. Got to yeah. get in one. Yeah. Well, 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 yeah. We need we need to touch. We base should talk because we yeah we had a a plan to the, to do a draft, so we we got to figure that out. Hmm. Yeah, we're, we're, and we were gonna maybe even try to look at some of the super high stake stuff, but I just don't know if like the scheduling is gonna work out with that. I have one s- registered that we can do but we can talk we can talk offline about that i don't i don't even know what the date of it is yet i just know i'm signed up for one of the like 5k nffc drafts okay yeah um yeah so uh, how many have you done you've been doing a lot of the the best ball tournament right Mm -hmm. mike yeah i'm starting to get the itch to do some managed teams like i said i gotta find my uh Davis Maddock waiver wire grinders for me in season. So I don't just throw a bunch of money you away, wanna, but put out a, a pitch here. This is a good crew to make a pitch to. I made a pitch earlier and I had like five people DM me. So I just got to go back and find those. So it's, it seems like it'll wow. be easy to find someone. How you make it fun. Let's get Leone's draft <laughs> intern video contest, two minute video applications. My dream <laughs> In in leagues that go three round reversal, <laughs> Sam Sam's just mad that I made him take Derrick Henry on our one entry. He's just oh god! Why you crazy. just said you didn't take bad running backs? Bad running. Backs. Well, I've I've I was probably I probably <laughs> messed gonna, that up. Sorry, sorry, Sam. For slandering you, ca- you caught me. You caught you me. Gotta Pat. Be careful what you say. Gotcha. <laughs> He's a good running back in real life. I'm just not. But the uh, the three round reversal drafts, if you pick twelfth, just seems so amazing to get the you know the one two turn and then come back at three and then you get that four or five turn before things fall off in round five. Those seem Did, can you absurd. can you like act, like didn't you say you can rank what um, draft slot you want there? On NFFC, you can rank your KDS. Your you can rank your draft settings, and then it's kind of like a lottery. So if you get picked first, you get your first choice. If you get picked second, it'll go to your first choice. It'll use that if it hasn't been selected yet. If it's already been selected, it'll go to your second choice. So like, if you're someone that's just sick of getting one o twos, you can put that further down or whatever in your preference. Yeah. Gotcha um okay here's here's a fun one for you what would you rank for best draft spots and obviously this can be different for best ball and managed. do you, you want to have a draft let's spot just, draft? draft let's have a draft spot draft for managed for managed for managed okay. yeah. yeah all right we'll are we get, doing ffpc or are we doing yeah uh, ffpc okay uh leone can go first 
one <laughs> boring but non third round reversal cmc definitely one pat i will go it's your only two. main event team yeah gun to your head your Ooh. only main event team three for me Twelve. Can you pull up a board? The, the board. I. Up. There's a uh, board. I was like, I look. Okay. So twelve you, is you tough because 12. if you if you if it was a wide receiver heavy draft and you didn't get Adams or Diggs or or Tyreek, like you'd be pretty annoyed. But I love picking at the turn and then to either go two of those three wide receivers or go one of the elite tight ends with one of those receivers. That's what I'm aiming for. So we've gone think, one, two, three, twelve. I think I'm still four because of what you can get coming back in the third. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I'm gonna push that further. I'm gonna go pick seven because I feel like you can generally have your pick of the Taylor Wallers generally there. If you want them, your pick of your wide receiver and you're in the middle, like that's where we've seen the CD lamb, the TD Higgins guys fall. I feel like you can kind of pick how you want to start and get some really good values that fall. So I'll go, I'll go seven. I still like the back end of the draft. So I'll go 11. I'll just keep tacking onto that. I'll go. Well, the other thing is that Adams pushes up now. So, yeah, 11 and 12 are gone. Be... I'll go 10. Okay. And then I will fill in uh, after seven. I'll say eight. I might be overly influenced by this specific board, though. <laughs> you know, because it's yeah. right in front of you. You're looking at it. Because the early part of the draft does have the, the fifth round, too, in its favor, depending – Hang on. What? Let me. This is what I'll do. I'll pull up the uh, the road of his. By the way, three was gone. I was saying four is blasphemy. Three was gone. Yeah, yeah, three. It went one, two, three. three was, which I think's uh, right. I think one, two, three is yeah. correct. I love yeah. three. Three's good because yeah, then you take the nice. remainder of Cook or or Kelsey. In fact, three yeah. is a better. I should have taken three instead of two. But, yeah, sucker, you got owned. Yeah. Damn it. This third okay. round AJ Brown stuff seems pretty good for the beginning yeah, part of the that's draft. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what do you like? What are your thoughts, Mike, on kind of that conversation we're having about like the the kind of the dominant structures versus, you know, passing potentially on the Adams and Diggs to get the structure you feel better about? Like where where are you at on that? Yeah, that's it's tough because I think there are a few like essentially what we're saying is the biggest upside is to kind of hit the home run at the onesie positions. Like let's like even count running back as a onesie position. Like you hit a home run with your RB one, you hit a home run with (laughs) hit a home run with like elite tight end, you hit a home run with quarterback. The issue I have is if you try to hit all three of those home runs, you're probably too weak at wide receiver. And I think I'd rather try and hit the home run at quarterback and tight end because it's a little harder to manufacture that than where's that running back we can manufacture. Quarterback maybe is different this year with the rookies. Yeah, we'll pull up the, the, the first main we did, Pete, because that's basically what we did. Oh, we tried sorry. to hit the home I, run. I had anyway. just gotten this up. This is just like the general main event ADP oh. draft grid. So, would, what, but which well, draft do you want up? The the very first main we did, I can just say we took Gibson, then Kittle, and then we took wide receivers all the way through until Daryl Henderson, um, and then we ended up grabbing Trey Lance, I think, in the eleventh, and Fields in the thirteenth. And we don't have a another quarterback, but we can use waivers preseason if we need to. Yeah, I do like that a lot. I think you need to. I think you can only swing for two of the three onesie positions, basically. Yeah. Which you get, you guys did, even though you did them early. I like that a lot. And then quarterback is the one spot where you can kind of get that late QB hit. Like, I mean, Lancer Fields could legitimately be top eight quarterbacks when they're starting every week. 
yeah, I don't, uh, that's not out of the realm of possibility whatsoever with the rushing upside. I still have a tough time taking, you know, Gibson over Devonte or Diggs, depending yeah. on what's there. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's a legitimate, you know, separation in terms of what Devonte and Diggs and full PPR could offer you over the course of a full season. They, they could just, to your point, Pat, about the wide receivers scoring more points than the running backs, they could just score so many more points that. Yeah. Diggs could be such a smash too. Like I was just looking at his stats from last year, and Gretch is so right about the touchdown thing. Because like compared to Adams, it's like the difference really between Diggs and Adams. It's like five points a game, but it's just like it's just touchdowns, really. You know, yeah. and in his second year there, like you could see his touchdown spike way up. I think. Yeah, he and did I- have a three touchdown game late too, which is kind of crazy that it even inflated it. Yeah. And. Mike, what's your take on – because, like, the, the whole reason, you know, love one of those elite tight ends is because I feel like everyone gets pushed up and is more expensive than they should be until you get really deep down to the, like, tight end 20 range here. Do you have detours that you don't mind at tight end in the middle rounds that you're even willing paying, like, a, a round ADP premium on? I think – if Pitts fell to the end of three, I mean, would, would you guys take Pitts there? I think I would. Swing Pat, on Pitts. Pat, the you're kind of anti Pitts, right? I'm I'm not really that into Pitts. I I think even there, like, I just don't necessarily see him like strongly outscoring Hawkinson and Andrews here. So, like, it's tough. Dude, like, I, I mean, see it, but we have like the pro. It's so hard to pin down the probabilities, right? It's such a just well, it's just, it's a guess, really. I guess the thing that's kind of crazy to me is like if you look at Calvin Ridley's rookie season and just convert it to tight end premium, he scored like I think it was fourteen point nine tight end premium points per game. Like Calvin Ridley had had tight end el- eligibility as a rookie. Like, like how much is he gonna? How much better of a rookie season can Pitts realistically have than Calvin Ridley did? Like, I think we're it's a pretty high bar we're we're putting up for this guy. And I don't, it's, it's not that I definitely don't a high bar. off, but he can pay off his ADP. But like, I guess I would, I'm, I'm having a, tr- a hard time seeing him bury me. Like, is he I really going to put I think, points a game? I think he could. I think he, we could be okay. drafting him in round one next year. Okay. Um, but it, but it's a, but it's a pure guess, you know, like, yeah, we have, we've never had this before. So it's, it's a straight up guess, but I, I would take Hawkinson or Andrews, I think, at the end of four. But it's tough because the receivers – like I, I'm not taking those guys, I think, over DJ Moore and Julio, You know, maybe over T. I don't know. That's yeah. tough too. Yeah. I think I would swing – if I'm in a main – I think that's where I'd treat a main event and like my, a 12-team just lead differently mm-hmm. where I'd probably mm-hmm. – I might swing for the tight end upside in the main event. Um, and I'm trying to the, get more – in in best ball mania and uh, Kyle's mentioning Dime Force really on him, which which is true. But um, there you can get him in like the fifth sometimes, which is a very different opportunity cost with the wide receivers. I think I really struggle here because of the wide receivers that you're passing on. Yeah, Fant and Goddard in round six just don't really do it for me. Me neither. Um, yeah, I, that's why it gets so tough. I took Fant. I think what was I got him? He slipped around. Was it round seven in in my pros versus Joe's? And I just I believe so. Yeah, or was it end around six maybe? Like yeah, it, looking something like that. Looking at this ADP board, guys, I could see detouring for like it's probably not until round ten. Then you know, Ingram seems okay. Tunyon maybe. I think Hunter Henry seems okay. Jarwin seems okay. I like Furtzer, but yeah, I guess those really aren't detours at that point, right? That just kind of have already drafted seven yeah. receivers, eight receivers. And, and to me, that just kind of illustrates why one of those top three tight ends is so huge is because, yes, if you get a value on Pitts, Andrews, Hawkinson, I think we're we're all open to that. But then we all agree Fant, Logan Thomas, Higby, and Goddard are too rich. And then it's like, okay, well, well, now you're now you're punting quarterback. Now you're now you're cranking purple, really. Yeah. And, and how do you punt in a, in a large field tournament where you have to be so good? And and I'm not saying it can't be done, but like, what do you think the odds are, you know, the main event team comes from someone who doesn't take a top five tight end? 
yeah, or have a top five tight end. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah, like, I, I mean, we, our, our crack rock team, which is, it's so ironic that the cranking purple team, we were weak at tight end. That was the weakest part of our starting lineup. It was because we hit on digs and, uh, Keenan. And, and Keenan, Keenan that we were yeah. so strong and we never had a guy emerge at tight end. We were cycling through Jared cook. I think we had Hawkinson and Hunter Henry on that. No, we team. didn't have Hawkinson there. We had Hawkinson sure? on our main. Oh, okay. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. We had, we yeah. went Hunter Henry. Um, I know we had taken Chris Herndon. Yes. You know, obviously that did nothing for us, but there was guys like that. We didn't, um, we waited. I think Hunter Henry's our first tight end pick. Yeah. And so it just like, I mean, that team was great, but yeah, didn't have the fire. I think there, there are obviously ways that you can build enough firepower elsewhere, but I see your point, Leone, as the contest gets bigger and I don't know, it's, it's very hard not to have that hammer at tight end. Yeah, oh, we you just can't Hawk. manufacture it. Hawk. You know, it's just. Why did we take Hunter Henry and Chris Herndon if we had Hawk? You were cranking purple, dude. Yeah, yeah I mean, you, you better get on board with that work. because that's what we're doing when uh, when I'm we draft board. with. I'm on board. <laughs> um, you don't sound on board, to be honest. I like Higby. I don't know. I, I still feel like I can tell myself a story with the Higby oh, outside. Yeah. See, we did have Hawk. Clay watched that stream today. I knew. We I had just Hawk said that. Then. I said it earlier. You said we didn't have Hawkins. I know. And then I said we did have Hawk. Like, literally, this whole interaction just happened. <laughs> you Quit bickering. Is, is literally Higby, I agree with you. I agree with Leone. <laughs> um, I'd much rather have Higby than Thomas. I think Higby, yeah, I think I think they're very close. But if I'm really swinging for the fences, it's probably Higby. But I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Thomas I ran don't know. a ton of routes. He has nowhere to go but down in terms of the – the pace of the offense was super high. The volume of the offense in terms of pass steps was super high. And then he ran like 99th percentile routes run for a tight end. Like I think he has a lot of room for regression in terms, just in terms of the base opportunity. Even there though, I'm probably waiting. Like there's Chanel, Chark, Debo, Boyd, like those four receivers in particular. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's, it's tough to pass on those. I guess it depends how wide receiver yellow early. You want we, we say pissing yellow around here yeah. now, Mike. Also, this, also no. Gallup and Fuller, I think, are, are really tough to pass on in that range, too. Well, they are, come, they are, they are, but but I guess then you could make the argument that you could maybe get one of those guys in round eight and then you're just doing the 2v2 where right. you know, maybe you took the suboptimal pick around earlier, but it was a better 2v2 in the end, yeah. And I think you know, the more we talk about it and getting these drafts under our belt. I, I do really think all these drafts come down to running back and tight end decisions because I feel like wide receiver and quarterback are so easy. Like we have elite wide receivers in the first couple of rounds. If you want to grab them, wide receivers are awesome rounds three through eight, like pick your flavor of wide receiver. They're there. And then quarterback is nice because you can take the detour for the elite one. If you get a screaming bargain, otherwise you're getting massive discounts on big upside swings like Lance, like Fields, Lawrence, Tannehill. And then if you need production week one, you can grab a Sam Darnold, you know, you can grab a big Ben or whatever. And, and be you could grab freaking Baker and Tua, right? Yeah. I mean, aren't they free? I mean, yeah. yeah. And so and it's just like, I know what I'm doing at wide receiver and tight end in every draft. And then it's just like, I feel like those first two rounds immediately now dictate like the, the rest of my entire draft. Like I know how it's going after that mostly. Yeah. It's really hard too, because each running back, I feel like you can paint a narrative that's pretty good, but then you, you know, we just know you get into danger territory, all the research Pat's done on it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm looking at the waivers on our team where we did take just fields and Lance and at quarterback, somehow Christian Kirk was not drafted, by the way, Pete. Uh, that might intrigue you. But, yeah, not wild. Uh, Matt Ryan, Baker Mayfield, Kirk Cousins, Daniel Jones, Zach Wilson, Ryan Fitzpatrick, Jameis Winston, Sam Darnold, Ben Roethlisberger, Derek Carr, Jared Goff, Taysom Hill. That's why I, I – Taysom didn't get drafted? Taysom didn't oh. get drafted. There's a lot of guys. There's a – like, we're going to have – Whoever we want. So to start I'm, it's, I'm kind of on the swing for the fences with these late QB picks the more you're going through it. Because mm -hmm. I think, you know, Baker and Tua, for example, like have 
like a small upside case to them. And, and those, and that's your security and like they're your security blanket with a small amount of upside then. And I don't mind burning an extra spot on a QB if it's that and a rookie that and God taste. I mean, three, three spots at QB is probably too much, but these guys aren't waivers. Like you said, you could just come out yeah. with a large bit week one. If, if something, you know, once Taysom is, if Taysom's the starter or something, you could really go for it. So that you kind of reduces your home run swings by one if you take out the quarterback, and now you're down to two. And I'm probably taking a swing on at least one of them. I guess draft spot sort of dictates whether you're doing it at tight end or not. Because if you're not at the back end, I guess if you're at the back end of the draft, you try to do it at tight end. Hopefully, kill Waller last. If you're at the front end of the draft, you know you're pretty much doing it with running back. Um, well, we have a draft we took before you came on. We we were showing one where we took Diggs at four, um, and then we got Kittle, and so now we oh, are. Oh, you position. did. Yeah, we got Kittle. Yeah, yeah coming back. Up. It's pretty nice. That's sweet. Yeah. So we'll see if the quarterback ends up making sense or not. But um, that kind of gave us the flexibility, like you're saying, like we could do two there with the quarterback, maybe. Um, but yeah, we we could end up just with one home run swing on this build. Yeah. You guys could have you guys could have taken Mike Davis in round five and taken your <laughs> um so Kyle, this is the nice thing about it. Um with Fields or Lance, I mean, we can go into the season if we bink one of them as a week a day one starter or whatever, then we're good. I think early on in the season, if they aren't starting, we will probably carry three quarterbacks at the start and then I think we'll continue to get information. Like we're going to see how bad Andy Dalton looks, how bad Jimmy Garoppolo, like where the trade winds are blowing. If both Dalton and Garoppolo are scorching the earth to start the season. All right. Maybe we're going to have to move on from one of these guys because there's too much opportunity cost for holding them. But I think it, it gives us a lot of flexibility there. Yeah. Are you finding even in the FFPCs these, I mean, this is a main event, so this is a big deal the wide receivers are dropping off as early as they are because that I feel like that's mildly to, I mean, I, I know you're a huge Ayuk fan, but to me, it's like, God damn, I really would have loved like T or Julio there. And in some of the best ball drafts I've gotten, you know, I've still gotten some of those round five receivers that seem to have disappeared from underdog and clearly weren't available here either. I think that right now it feels like some of these wide receivers are getting a little bit pushed up compared to mm -hmm. the way it tends to feel like in August and September. Like, do you agree with that, Pete? Like it feels like the, the wide receivers in like rounds kind of three, three through six or so are like a little bit more expensive than they, than they are the day before the draft or the day before the season starts. Yeah, I could see that. And I, I think that's also where we could probably see the shift as we get closer to the season, right? Where the running backs that people start to get more confident on inch up into the third round where we're not seeing a lot of picks right now uh, for running backs. And then the kind of elite wide receivers get pushed down a half a round. I think, I think we could see that a decent amount. Javante, Javante is probably going to move up, you know, ETN will probably move up. I think team 12 here is interesting where I could see, you know, taking that swing on hunt, just given where the receivers got, I don't know if I would have gone hunt and Dak, but if we're doing like the, you know, punt QB down the line a little bit and take the upside swings on the double digit round guys, like hunt and Claypool there seems, you know, super reasonable mm -hmm. to me, but then you will probably not doing Damian Harris and a, you know, likely, yeah. you know, doing gallop Before, there. Yeah. Or, yeah. Yeah. Right. I mean, so yeah, I think you bring up a good point, Mike, in that there definitely is, a tear break within those wide receivers as much as we like it. I think like the thesis with this one, right. is like, we're taking so many cracks at like are all IU Claypool, Chanel and Elijah Moore and Bateman going to hit. No, but even if, even if one of those was Justin Jefferson, you know, we're doing cartwheels and maybe we get two T Higgins yeah. out of that group. And we're like absolutely cooking. And where you, your team, you guys had Gibson, whereas Team 12, when they took Hunt, didn't have a running back. So you already kind of took your onesie swing. And at that point, structurally, you're just saying, we, you know, even it doesn't matter if it's too early for Ayuk in a vacuum, right? Like that's irrelevant. Ayuk's the best wide receiver bet we can make here. 
and we just need to keep making the best wide receiver bet for the next exactly what you guys did the next for seven straight rounds basically exactly yeah. yeah and that's i feel like that's what you have to do if you're not taking those wide receivers right because it's like we're mm-hmm. already behind versus the tyree kill and Diggs team how do we catch up keep making the best possible bets at wide receiver for seven or eight rounds i am starting as i see more of these boards though have this middle of the first pete you took in our draft just now like the seventh pick I mean, someone here could have gone, you know, Devontae Adams, DeAndre Hopkins, A.J. Brown. <laughs> you know, right. Like, granted, this is a little different. Like, Akers is in there. You remove Akers. That's somebody that's out. You remove Michael Thomas. That's somebody. Like, th- those injuries really kind of suck because you're less likely to really hit the super strong bet there. But Well, that's that's actually why I think the four and the five spot basically went undrafted. Mm-hmm. But look at the five spot here. You know, you could go – well, they got Devontae Adams in the second. That's not happening anymore. But you could go Devontae Adams, DK Metcalf, AJ Brown. And you're more likely yeah. to have AJ Brown go there. And then you're more likely to get T. Higgins in five, too. Right. Right. Yeah. And you so still could get Lockett in four. You know, you go Lockett, T. Um, you're also kind of in the mix with the elite quarterbacks where you if you don't get T, you could always take one in in five if you want. Um and yeah, that's it's, growing it's, on me. Frank, Frank was bringing this up on our other board. Um, we did, we did consider that. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it, though, it goes back to that thing we were just talking about with the amount of great options at quarterback it, and we were talking about this for best balls and stuff too, Mike, like the opportunity cost for, for grabbing that elite quarterback is, is very high when the quarterback depth at both like, you know, immediate production and upside is just, it's really hard to pass up on that late. And Especially what we were saying, you, you can take, you know, two swings at the onesie positions. That would have been your third swing in five rounds. You know, that's at, at a certain point, you're just not going to get the receiver points that you need, which is, you know, the basic crux of, I think what we all believe in. Yeah. Yep. Oh, I was actually thinking of the other board. Um, I thought that's what Frank was asking about. He was. He was. He's asking oh, okay. about um, the draft we started with Diggs and then Kittle. Sorry, I keep going back and forth. Oh, I was looking at the wrong. I think I was looking at the So wrong. he's talking I about this one here where we took Ayuk. Allen goes right after and We could have stacked Diggs and him. Um, Which we did consider. Yeah. But. Where are you? Oh, yeah. That one's tough. That. That. That, that one feels like if I was doing enough main event teams, I might have made the Allen decision, just knowing that you guys are probably getting Ayuk at 5-6 a decent bit, and you're probably doing a lot of later QB teams, and that was a natural kind of break-even point to get Allen. Not that you had to do it, but it, it definitely seems close, like at least like a coin flip. We, yeah, we did all, consider yeah. him, yeah. And this is also, uh, we were letting people know too, Mike, this is a team we're co-managing with uh, – mm-hmm with Matt from the discord. So we're also making sure that uh, everyone's getting the kind of teams they want. So we might yeah. have a lot of like wh- where Pat and I will balance our exposures are going to be in some of our, you know, drafts that we do say with you or with Ben, whereas when we're, we're managing with people, if this is their only main event draft, like we want to make sure they get, you know, the players. hundred percent. Yeah. Um, Would you guys have gone, if you had taken, let's just say Ridley in round two, would you have taken Andrews over Ayuk or Allen in round five? Yes. Yes. I think there, Andrews was a real value. We and, were, and I Andrews, versus, Andrews versus Ayuk is like even kind of interesting with the yeah. two wide receiver, two flex. Like I think Ayuk's probably the right choice, but it's, it's somewhat but it's close. Yeah. And then you get the structure, you know. What was I, I, the Paulson I, I, thing he said about tight ends? Starve, starve, starve the beast. The, beast. <laughs> the thing is, is like the room's going to starve the beast naturally. This was a weird yeah. slide for Andrews. I mean, look at the gap between Andrews and Fant. I mean, that's crazy. It's pretty wild. Yeah, I was excited to see Fant go off because we don't, we just want to see purple at this point. Yeah. All right. The wet blanket is now hosting none of these. Buy four streams that go for two and a half hours while I'm <laughs> yeah. Well, let's hang on. Before we wind down, I do want to 
just shout out Leone's article that he just got out right before the show went live, which is awesome. Did you were able to read uh, it before? I, I saw. Yeah, it. I, I read it. I have it booked. I read it. Murphy. I tried not Murphy. to write too much because I was just like, this is overwhelming, and I don't even know how useful this is. But here's some bullet points. <laughs> there was some good nuggets in there, man. The uh, the thing that you had, so you are diving into like why the hyper fragile strategy is working and kind of why the zero running back strategy is working and sort of like what picks we're making at work and everything. I thought the most interesting thing to me was that guys like Todd Gurley like were actually helping the hyper fragile builds because they did score points in the beginning of the season. And if you're, if you're kind of wired to want to take the Deandre Swift or the Jonathan Taylor, or this year, the Javante Williams, the guys are going to come, come on down the stretch that guy's much better paired with a zero running back build. And I, I thought that kind of player archetype yeah. thought process was really interesting to have. You you actually might be targeting a somewhat different type of player uh, versus the two structures. Yeah, I I was hoping to get even more out of the archetype stuff, but like at some point you can't force it. And that was one of the, the clear ones. And there were a lot of other clear ones. Not to extend this too much. Uh, I did find like the Kelsey stuff interesting where – Hyper fragile teams had like 4% Kelsey or something, you know, average is 8.3%. Zero RB teams had 31% Kelsey. And there's part of me that's like, well, zero RB teams should have done even better than they did versus hyper fragile teams on the basis of that alone. And then part of me is like, well, that's the point of the zero RB team is you get Kelsey. So you can got, like interpret it a couple different Michael ways. Thomas exposure, yeah. Which obviously crushed. Yeah. It, I was I, I didn't get to read your article yet, but I've always wondered that too about like and we we joke about it with like the Eno Benjamin win rates just because the type of player that they're drafting and like it, yeah. on underdog last year, if you were going zero RB, you were probably drafting at least one of Michael Thomas or Kelsey with those picks. Like, is there and this goes back to like getting the unique starts where it's like the structure is viable, but because we're anchored to ADP, we end up with the exact same guys in that range. Like, I guess what I'm trying to flesh out is their, their merit to, you know, starting trying to get those early starts that are zero RB and that aren't that different bets that are, I don't know, 15 picks after ADP. Yeah. The zero RB teams get way more condensed as their exposures up top. I mean, there was like 42% Michael Thomas, like 35 to 38% Devonte Adams and Tyreek Hill like they were like absurd I think this year it might be different where I feel like we have a better second tier of wide receivers with like mm -hmm. Ridley Metcalf and those guys but last year it was kind of nuts and I don't know a lot of it came down to I think the hyper fragile structure really works and makes a lot of sense but at the same time all the research Pat's shown is your actual early round picks are way better to be better in zero RB and like wouldn't you rather have the picks early that are way to be better so i don't know it's like a little i, I kind of came up with like you should maybe probably you mix try up your mix up your structures to some extent because that's yeah. how you're going to mix up your exposures right like if kelsey sucked last year hyper fragile would have killed and zero right. rb would have been bad but kelsey was also like more likely to have the season he was than anyone on the hyper fragile build so it works both ways so mixing it up but also doing some like flexible like Maybe I'll take it's the hero RB builds kind of like stick out to me, you know. Like, let's make our one RB bat. I love the, the hyper, yeah. You know, the hyper fragile team show that, like, if you hit on the RB, your win rates like escalate, like, they amplify even more than the field taking that RB. So, we we make that one bet, but then we still get access to these players like Tyree Kill, Devontae Adams, Travis Kelsey, that we know in a vacuum are just way better bets than any running back at that point in time. You kind of mix it. And then it's like, gets a little more flexible from there. I think it makes for a, a more challenging draft because you have to be way more thoughtful through like the whole way versus if you're going super extreme, it's like pretty obvious what to do at the midpoint of the draft to the end, because right. like you either have to hammer wide receivers or you have to hammer zero running back guys. The, um, the point you were making in the article about like, one option is to take like let's say a Devonte Adams, and then you know you can go with Antonio Gibson or you can go with a Ceh, you know, or whoever else you happen to like in the second round, and that is the hero running back build. But you're doing it with the second round pick, and it was you kind of made the point in the article like if you do that, 
you have the flexibility to kind of see what room you're in. And if you want to yeah. make that a zero running back build, you can. If you want to, you know, like I was in, I mean, this is like an extreme example because it was a bunch of people watching the show who were in the draft with me today. Uh, we did a live stream and I took digs in the first round because I was like, I don't know who made it in here. Like, how nutty is this going to be? And then it quickly like, oh, it's all it's all a bunch <laughs> of shit pacers. Like, I can't, I ended up getting Mixon in the third. But like, you know, less extreme examples of that were you give yourself the chance for like a Gibson to fall to you in the second if you have like the 105 or 106 or something. And then, you know, you take that gift and you can work your draft from there. I thought that was another interesting point too. It's also like, it's a bit of a, uh, like a mind fuck and thing about that. Like if we had 150 main event drafts, I think we would be so much more comfortable letting those natural kind of fallers in specific drafts give you unique starts. Whereas like, I feel like even having 13, 14 main event drafts, like we could end up with the 11 slot in five or six of them, you know? And it's just like, you are going to maybe have to force diversification with your early picks in a small sample. Yeah. Yeah. That's definitely a challenge. And it, I think at that point it's like almost personal risk tolerance. If you want to keep making what you think is the best pick available or switch it up. Like, I don't even really know what I would do. I guess it, hopefully they're spread out enough that. Well, Pete launched his own NFT. So I think, you know, what our personal risk tolerance is. Liam. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I, I'm, I'm bummed. I can't chime in on this conversation because I have this article bookmarked to, uh, to read tomorrow, but I saw lots of fun charts that I'm excited to, uh, to dig into. <laughs> so it's a nerd's dream. I was going to say, I don't know if I'm going to be able to it make a video is. on that one, Leone. It might be a little, too <laughs> yeah, it, it very well, maybe. Um, all right. Well, this is as fun as always we'll get uh gretch back in the saddle and as we said I, I do plan to get some kind of schedule out to let you guys know all of our uh drafts but there'll be plenty of streams to watch drafts to jump into all of that good stuff and we have been saying this we will be in vegas we booked our flights we're going to be doing drafts on friday watching the game at planet hollywood on thursday and we're going to throw a little ship chasing party on friday night uh, we'll have more details to go but uh, on that, but uh, let us know if you're planning on going to Vegas so we can meet up. It'll be a fun time. Leone, anything else going on with you? Not too much. You know, just grinding content, getting ready for DFS as well. So I'm I'm just excited for the month of August. I think it'll, it'll go by really quickly, but it should be a fun month. Pat, anything going on at NBC Sports Edge this week? Yeah, let me get, let me get in the, uh, in the, the peacock, peacock here. Pat. Yeah. Yeah. Let me just say <laughs> that uh, we got a good football show. I'm hosting every every Tuesday at two thirty. Make sure you're checking those out. Got some good running back content coming out on the site as well. And that's uh, blurb season, baby. Blurb season. Let's do it, guys. We'll see you next week. <laughs>